okay. Welcome, more gamers. My name is Doug with Two Plus Stuff, and you're watching and listening to While You're Reforging, my regular Warhammer Age of Sigmar podcast that I'll be going into. Uh, this is actually a very special episode because it is episode one of me being an official podcast. I decided to go ahead and take the audio from these and uh, throw it up online. I'll still do live shows on uh, YouTube. You can figure out when I'm doing those by joining me on Facebook and Instagram. Either one, I post basically the same messages to both of them, but tune in for that. I have a lot of fun with those things. Uh, so how it's going to work here is I've asked a lot of viewers to send in questions for me, so we'll be going through those. And things are just going to be a little more tightened up here to keep me on track, uh, since I don't have an audience that's live to ask questions and engage with. So go ahead and sit back, drag out some models and paints, and go ahead and paint along with me, and we're going to have a lot of fun. Today's topics are all about kind of some things that I've been engaging with with a new edition. We have uh, Fire Slayers in general, because I'm just picking up that army, as well as my thoughts on the new summoning, specifically for corn, but it kind of applies to all of them. So give me a minute, let me turn this camera down so I can, you can see me painting, and we'll start digging into a great episode. All right, diving headlong into hobby progress. If you are not following me on Facebook or Instagram, you probably have not seen that I have picked up a whole bunch of Fire Slayers, and I'll put them here for my YouTube viewers. Uh, but just to kind of keep, you can go check them out there for everyone who wants to take a look at them. Uh, really what I'm doing is a more traditional Fire Slayer look with the a very orange and bright uh, fiery hair and beard as well as just the general skin tone. Uh, the story behind them is they're going to be set in the realm of life, Garan. I haven't decided on how to base them yet so I'd like to hear your thoughts on those. Uh, I think I'm going to go with the sterling mud in the bottom to kind of give them that kind of earthy look. Uh, I did gray and kind of ashy things for the Slaves to Darkness so I'll be passing on that because I want it to be a little bit different. Having a lot of fun painting these guys, more fun than I thought I would. And so uh, if you are following along on YouTube, you will see there is just a whole bunch of primed black models here. I got a bunch of these pre-primed. Uh, black is not my color of choice when it comes to priming, but it's what I got. And uh, this is going to be a fairly boring episode if you're watching live because, uh, frankly, I'm just going to do a whole bunch of base coating. Uh, so as far as hobby progress goes from the last time I recorded anything, I knocked out 10 Volkite Berserkers. This set of 10 has the... Uh, picks and shields, which is sort of a highly suggested default mode. Uh, I want to talk about the Fire Slayers more as one of my main topics. Um, but yeah, between them and I got a bunch of heroes. And I got the Battlesmith, uh, the basically the Lords of the Lodge formation. Because uh, uh, rerolling one guys are cool with using the effects from it. Which is really, really a huge deal for me. Again, we'll talk about the lodges with that in a little bit. Uh, but I had a lot of fun, like I said, painting these guys up. Uh, let's, they're, they're one of those cool models in terms of hobby progress that, like, really, they're, they're easy to speed paint because once you get the flesh and the beard done, everything else is just color block and wash. And, and you can go really um, headlong into super detailed, like, non-metallic metals and those kinds of things. I'm, I'm not that way. Uh, I, I can tell people... My, my paint style is three foot gorgeous, which is to say when you stand it and you put it on the tabletop, it looks absolutely amazing, but it's not going to win any Golden Demon Awards or anything like that. That's not my goal as a hobbyist. And uh, so, you know, I think it looks great. It's going to look great in the channel for rerolling once, those guys in their battle reports. But, uh, you know, not winning any awards, not taking trophies home, that's okay. Unless there's like a general, I don't know, trophy, like just like a just best painted army, which is just like a total total thing. That's probably the closest I will ever come. Let's see. I always hate when you have to build them with like their weapons on and so like you can't really get to their eyes. That's always the worst thing. Moving on from that. So yeah, that is uh, 10 Volkites with Pick and Shield. There's the Rune Father, Battlesmith, and Rune Smiter. Basically most of the dudes who were, came in the Star Collecting box. And so they were fun to build. I actually speed painted those in a day. So we'll see how fast. Really honestly, the longest part when it comes to this, it's always your primary color that tends to slow you down. So for these, uh, this basically this whole army, their main color is their flesh. So that's 
building up from the black primer that was already on some of these units it really does take quite a bit of time make sure you get a nice solid coat of flesh tones with any you no know, gaps or whatever like that you know so there's a big black spot for some reason <laughs> and all of that as far as progress that i'm working on in the future well uh if you're looking along there's what 15 dudes on the table now i need to paint 21 in completion uh, to be able to have these guys on rerolling ones here pretty soon because we film a few weeks in advance uh, so you won't see them on the table quite yet uh, but i am hoping to have them on very very soon uh, I, I did decide to basically shelf my slaves to darkness army uh, for a time being and the reason for that is very simple is that i love chaos undivided that's where my heart is it's what i want to play it's the army that excites me when i think about the lore and the background and uh, what they've done so far with 2nd edition is not very conducive to that. The Slaves to Darkness rules I've played uh, four times now. Um, and, and in all different kinds of different configurations and things like that. And it's just... There's just not a lot of depth there. Yeah, and I know people were really great about leaving comments about different synergies and stuff like that. And I, I have proxied and tried several. And, and this is not just from this edition. This is from before, too. Because the, you know, the abilities and stuff didn't change dramatically. Uh, and, and just to keep up and experience all the cool things that second edition has i just decided to put them on the shelf for right now until uh my my rumored dark oath book comes out which would make me the happiest you know marauder in the legion so uh yeah that's kind of the plan there and that's that's why I, our, our last game which i'll talk about here in games played in a second uh really got me pumped for fire slayers and that's exactly why the next day i went home and just cranked out 13 of them yeah 13 uh because i had such a good time and i just am really excited for second edition it's actually been a blast for me a big nice jolt of uh hobby juices coming in okay so by the next episode obviously i plan to have everything you see here and a little bit of extra because i still have to do some building and priming and things like that Moving into games played in this section, uh, just because this is my first episode I want to explain, uh, I'll be talking about any games that I didn't do for re-rolling ones, because I don't like spoilers, I don't want to ruin anyone's experience on their channel. Uh, if there's something pertinent, I'll share it, but uh, that's not what this is going to be about. And I did have a game that was not on re-rolling ones against re-rolling one Jack. We met at a local game store uh, called Mox Boarding House here in Bellevue, Washington. Which is a great store. If you are in the area, go check it out. I mean, I'm sure if you're in the area, you've already been there because it's like megalithic in size and a uh, great, great place for tournaments and things like that. Uh, but uh, yeah, we played there. It got there pretty early in the evening and started playing. So Jack brought his corn, which he was anxious to try out the new uh, free summoning. Well, I, I, I hesitate to call it free. But for the purposes of understanding points-wise, points-free, there's still a resource involved. I think that's very important to state because it's going to become very relevant in the game. Uh, it's not free. None of these summoning things are free in totality. Uh, but they do require a different resource other than points. To that end, um, I brought my Slaves to Darkness, but I used Maggotkin of Nurgle Rules. Uh, there were some trees at the store that, that we just grabbed. Uh, to kind of proxy as my feculent Narmals. And um, I think, I'm pretty sure at least two of them were from the Wildwood kit. Which I do like that as a stand-in, by the way. I wasn't sure how I felt about it until I had them on the table. And I was like, oh, this totally works. Going into our game, uh, I think I made some critical mistakes early on. Basically, uh, as far as the lists go, he had two units of Blood Warriors, I think. Or maybe one of them was... Um, the named character unit from Shadespire. I know he had that one, uh, but I couldn't tell if he had a second small unit of Blood Warriors. Bunch of Blood Reavers. He had um, Garrick's Reavers. Uh, all Basically all the Shadespire kits because they're amazing when it comes to Blood Tithe points. If you're a corn player, go buy them. It's the best 50 bucks you'll probably spend. <laughs> Just based on, on what uh, I saw in our game, if I was a corn player, I certainly would. Uh, and he loaded up his list to not manipulate, that's not the right word, but really dive down on the Blood Tithe point system. Now that he's able to bring things on the table. So he has a Warlord that, like, when the... He has a weapon that, under certain conditions, can get you a Blood Tithe point. He had three priests because he had a Gore Pilgrim uh, battalion. So they were, like, hurting each other because there's a prayer you can do that takes D3 mortal wounds and... 
You gain a blood tithe point. So he was just hurting himself, trying to kill his own units to get blood tithe points. And then he killed the units and he got blood tithe points. And you know what I mean? It was just a lot of that, um, really pushing that mechanic to the limit. And, uh, Anyway, so that was what his list was designed to do, and it worked out perfectly for him. As far as me and what I brought, I had a block of 40 Marauders, two blocks of 10 uh, Warriors, 10 Chaos Marauders on horseback, uh, two units of five Knights. I actually had a tragic thing where my Knights fell off the side of a table and bust off their base, but they're all in one piece. I just got to re them. Um... I have the Glotkin, because I have that model and have not played him for years. So I busted out my Glotkin. Uh, he was really the all-star. Um, going into the game, as far as what I expected, I didn't expect much, because I did not have a lot of time to study you know, uh, the kind of intricacies of the Maggotkin, like spell lores and things like that. My basic plan was get my Marauders into combat, and uh, put the, the Rotbringer spell blue blades of putrefaction on them which is if you roll a six to hit it does a mortal wound uh, in addition to any other damage um and so my my thought was like send the marauders as a big wall just tie something up have the glotkin pop his command ability a few times giving everyone multiple attacks um and and you know what i mean just kind of create this like just sheer numbers i'm going to get enough sixes to really burn out some of those units and then hopefully burn out his Marauders and Blood Warriors early enough so that I still have dudes who can handle whatever he summons with blood type points. That was kind of the general idea. Um, and, and in that respect, it almost worked perfectly, except that I made a critical mistake. During turn one, um, I was uh, Jack went first, he ran everything forward, and um, of course everything was kind of in, in prime charge range. I goofed up with the Glotkin's command ability. Um, I didn't realize that you have to do it in the hero phase. And so I passed over it. And then I was looking at the table. And I was like, wait, oh, I have a feculent arm on the dead center of the table. I can actually run my entire army and then charge everything. But because I didn't have the command ability up, no one was getting those bonus attacks. I, got, I managed to get um, the Blades of Putrefaction off. We'll talk about why that was actually a blessing here in a second. But uh, I missed my massive opportunity. I think what lost me the game uh, more than anything was the fact that when my dude swung on that opening swing, it was not nearly as hard as it could or should have been. And so basically what happened was the Marauders went forward um, and just kind of ground out the center we were playing. Uh, I can't remember, I can't remember the, the mission names, but it's the one where like a, a meteor strike comes on turn two and then like on turn three two other falls down on the other territories and you're all just fighting over control of who gets those points those points on the board and so uh basically because i had larger blocks of units rather than a bunch of small ones like jack had he was able to pin me down for the most of the game and then go and capture at least one of the objectives enough to get points for everything for winning uh turn two or three Three, he got enough blood tithe points to bring in a bloodthirster, uh, which went toe to toe with the Glotkin. Uh, I forgot to mention he had Scarbrand in his list, was kind of the, the only real big thing. Everything else was small, Marauders, dies easy. Um, but Scarbrand, whoo, he deleted a unit of Chaos Warriors in one go. Uh, I don't think I've ever played against Scarbrand before. You know, someone who just gets mad when you kill him. <laughs> um, so that was actually a ton of fun. I, I remember people saying that he wasn't that great, and I, I just looking at the table, I mean, I also don't have a whole lot of shooting in my Slaves of Darkness, it's literally just the Marauders. So I could see if you go against a shooting army, he could just probably be mitigated pretty well, because uh, he doesn't have a great save or anything like that, but he sure enough did a lot of work in our game, so I'd, that has not been my experience that he is not that great. So yeah, that all went down, and uh, he basically just pinned me down with my large units in place. Uh, and wrote out the scenario, which is exactly what you should be doing. So the whole point in, in his approach was to really kind of double down on the um, mechanics for bringing in units. He was very skeptical. Uh, Jack was very skeptical openly, and this is nothing like um, secret about, about the summoning stuff, just because uh, if you were around in the old days playing Warhammer Fantasy Battles, there was a very 
easy chance of getting the feel badsies with games where, and I expressed this on on two plus as well. Uh, back in the old days, you could just summon whatever you wanted. There was really no limit, and so the you, things that you would summon, like zombies and um, not really just anything like that. Zombies is the biggest offender because they're the easiest to summon and the cheapest. Um, they wouldn't kill anything. They would just tie up the game, and all of a sudden the uh, death player just went on scenario because nothing's happening on the board, which is not fun at all. It has created negative play experiences, and so I was very skeptical when they brought back the quote-unquote free summoning. Um, I'm going to call it free summoning because it's an easier shorthand, but you know what I mean. There's still a resource involved. And so I was very skeptical of that, and uh, um, seeing on, on how it played out on the table... And this is with a list that is designed to make the most of that mechanic. I'm not going to say abuse it because there was nothing loopholy about it. It was just he picked everything that allowed him to participate in that mechanic. Uh, I I like it. I actually like it. I walked away, even though I got just absolutely curb stomped, I actually walked away with a really good experience and, and a good understanding of how those things, they seem very abstract when you read them in a book and they can very easily seem overwhelming. You know, he, he saved up for a Bloodthirster, um, and he got one pretty early in the game, but I was able to put some real damage in that Bloodthirster and Scarbrand with my list. Um, the the reason I lost had nothing to do with him and his summoning. It had everything to do with me not giving enough of an opening swing that first turn because I forgot about the Glotkin's command ability. Or, not that much that. I, I forgot about the running and charging, and so... I wasn't ready to deliver that real punch when I charged when I did. And so, yeah, uh, it was just, I think it had more to do with me and my player skill than anything to do with the free summoning. And so, kind of looking back on it, and there's pictures of our game. Uh, Jack posted them on, he's a Jack at Rerolling Ones uh, on Instagram. And uh, I, can try and I, can, I can try to find someone and post them on my Instagram as well. Had a great game, it looked beautiful, fully painted armies as is standard for us. But what I was noticed is just like, I never felt like I didn't have a chance. You know what I mean? The units that he summoned, they participated in the game. I think the biggest, uh, the most important rule they added in addition to the summoning things for certain factions was the fact that everyone has to fight because that way you're, you're not getting into those situations where you have kind of non-games by just tying up units and then not engaging with them at all. And combat is very brutal in this game. Like, the units get deleted pretty quickly in our stuff. And so having those things um, forced to fight, I think, was an important decision. I think that's the kind of secret balancing factor to some of these things. And I think that doesn't get noticed enough. Um, yeah, so I had a great time. So Jack's a great opponent. Jack, if you're listening, good on you. You should all go uh, check out Rerolling Ones. I hope that list uh, is on there pretty soon. It didn't feel... It didn't feel tough as nails. Like, uh, I think he even agreed that there's probably room for uh, Im improvement. I think for corn players, the balancing factor is going to be how do I balance a bunch of expendable troops who die really, really easily to get blood tide points and then also have things that actually stay on the table? Like, blood warriors stay on the table, I think, much longer. Uh, they're easier to buff. They do more damage. Nobody wants to fight them. Uh, I certainly never want to fight them. Whenever I touch one of Jack's Blood Warriors, I have a bad day. Just because they just eat up my units. Just destroy them. Um, but yeah, and I think that's 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 really going to be the balancing factor of like, I need to stay on the board in a meaningful way and not lose ground. Because when you summon, you can't do it. Like, you can't summon into combat. So you can't lose board presence, um, so you have to have units that are a little bit tougher, but at the same time, you want your stuff to die to get those blood type points. So that's, I like I said, I think that's going to be the real balancing factor. Now, as far as Magadkin goes, looking at their stuff, of course, I took all Slaves to Darkness units except for the Glotkin, and, and didn't really maximize their abilities, uh, so I'm not claiming to be a, a Magadkin player at, at all. Um, they have some really cool things. What I will say is that the, their spell lore and um, some of the abilities they do have available to them, those trees, man, those trees are legit. <laughs> I, I found myself, um, I got enough uh, contagion points to summon a second thing, or a, a summon a tree, or whatever I wanted to do, uh, on turn two. And I was just looking at them more, I was like, man, I don't want to summon anything but trees. I love these things, and so... 
um, if anyone on the planet can ever get their hands on a Fecula Normal because they've been having stock issues, you know, can do that, they should absolutely go buy some darn trees. They're really cool. Also, I do recommend trying out the Citadel Wildwood as a stand-in. I know the base size isn't the same, but the thing about the trees is it says um, any model that in 7 inches of it can charge and uh, even if it ran in the same turn. But man, 7 inches is such a big bubble that like, I don't know. Having the actual Fecula Normal would make that range bigger, but I never needed it. I put five knights and 40 marauders and i was able to get those and 10 chaos warriors all within seven inches of a fecula norma so i i don't think you need the bigger base size if that's that's what you're worried about obviously if you're going to a tournament everything should be um you know standard just to keep things above board but you know if you're doing casual play with your friends just go buy a citadel wildwood and convert your heart out put a bunch of neural junk on them and get yourself some trees. So that might, might be what's happening for us. Magakin's a good, I think, temporary way to use my Slaves to Darkness in this down season. Um, just because, like I said, I'm, I'm done with the the Slaves to Darkness uh, Allegiance abilities. But I like, you know, I have a wonderfully painted Glockkin. I have a lot of fun painting him, and so he might make his debut onto Rerolling One sometime soon. And that kind of completes the the game that I had played. Just that one where we were really maxing out the mechanic of the, the blood type points, which we'll talk about here in a little bit. Uh, and so what I want to do now is move into listener questions. So if you have a question that you would like to answer, have on the show, you may absolutely do that. Uh, and I'll get you the web address for that. But we're going to just basically open it up. How I do these is just, it's a very simple send in an email. Uh, if you head over to the... Uh, YouTube page. Any of the Warrior Forging videos are going to have that link, and I will always have it in the description of any podcast that I put up. Uh, it's a bit.ly link just to make it all short because my website tail is kind of long, but basically it's uh, bit.ly at WYRQ&A. So go ahead and check that link out. Shoot your question to me. Name's optional, of course, because uh, internet privacy, or you can use your username on YouTube just so people can uh, recognize you. So first question comes from Derp, D-E-R-P, I respect that. Uh, how do I start a gaming community in my area? Uh, wow, that's kind of a loaded question. That's a great topic. I think I'll probably do a whole show about that. But fundamentally, what I would say is um, there's a lot of follow-up questions for that one. Uh, a big one would be, you know, do you have a game store? Even if they don't do miniatures, like do you have Magic the Gathering, right? Any kind of card shop or, or board game place. Uh, I don't know anything about your area. If you do, just go to the store owner and you can just basically ask them, hey, if I were to have some models and some kits and do um, demos, would you mind just kind of giving me a space and a time where I could do that and then kind of publicize it? Would you be interested in selling Games Workshop products? You know what I mean? If I help build you an audience and just kind of work with the store owner. Because the thing is, is that at the end of the day, they're probably going to make the money off the whole thing like off the transactions like that so it's in their best interest to listen to you and, and really try to get you to promote things uh, at the same time uh, the, the kind of keys to success when it comes to those things is consistency if you say you're gonna have a regular game night you need to be there every game night with models that are ready to be played um, I always suggest having painted models because it shows people the best parts of our hobby um, if you're starting from scratch and your area, you know, allows you to do that, go grab Soul Wars, or not even Soul Wars. Um, they're coming out with the smaller sets that don't have the big book in it. It's gonna be eighty bucks. Some Night Haunt, some Stormcast. It's gonna have actually the bulk of those sets, just not all of it. Um, grab that and paint them up to a good standard. Maybe not like Golden Demon level, but something achievable that also looks good. And and just um, go to a local store and publicize. Hey. I'm going to be here playing this awesome game, Age of Sigmar, have models and terrain out looking good. Uh, It doesn't have to be professional at all. Just really just put your best foot forward. Think of it as a handshake, putting your best parts of your hobby out there on display. Um, Whatever reason you got excited about it, I'm sure there's someone else who will get excited about it as well. And that's probably the best answer I can give you. Just be consistent about your times if you're going to have a regular night. Um, having models for people to just walk up and play and they don't need any experience or buy-in uh, other than their time, which is a big deal, um, is great to have. 
and just being able to answer any questions, get to know the rules real well, and just kind of make games fun. And, and, and fun is defined a lot of different ways. If the person is more competitive, you can highlight some of the competitive aspects, that there's a whole international tournament scene for it, uh, which is absolutely true. Um, if they are really into the story, like have some black library books in your mind, be like, yeah, this is what's really legit about this thing, is you can create these stories and this narrative. You know, I mean, it's just a matter of um, finding people who also find the things that you find fun and, and just really diving in with that together. Again, it's a very hard question to answer because there's uh, so many follow-up questions that I would ask you about your community and um, what you have available to you. If you're in the U.S., there's typically a store nearby. I know folks overseas, uh, particularly in London, they used to have game clubs, uh, which I, I'm not uh, familiar on the kind of the best practices for those um, I love the idea of them. It's just in the States, we don't really have to do anything like that. And so um, there are probably better people to answer that question if you're over in that neck of the woods. So uh, sorry, Derp. Couldn't help you more. I, I, I Like I said, I want to do a whole video on that topic. It's a great idea. Uh, not so much for a quick, fast lightning round Q&A. <laughs> so let's go down here. Uh, Dylan asks, uh, I kind of... I find it quite fun to come up with lore for my minis, but no one wants to listen to me ramble for hours about it. What is the best way to share your model stories and to encourage narrative thoughts from your playgroup? So how do you encourage narrative thoughts and modeling and play and things like that is kind of the, the operating question I'm going to walk away with that from. Uh, and that is a great idea. What I would say, primarily, uh, a great way to introduce folks to narrations like that is to model someone uh, off of a story. So if you are thinking of, like, uh, Gardas from the Stormcast Eternals, you could take a Stormcast leader and uh, do something to him that will be you know, reminiscent of Gardas and show it to people and they're like, oh, why'd you do XYZ modification or conversion? You could tell them, well, because in the story, Gardas does this, this, and this, and you know what I mean? And, and what you're doing is you're piquing their interest on one thing and then showing how those things connect to a cool storyline and, and really why that's important to you. Uh, and that's kind of that's typically my way of doing it. Uh, another cool thing would be uh, creating memories, and I think that is a, a essential part of this hobby, and a topic of a lot of discussion we've had over on with the rerolling ones guys, my hobby group. The idea um, that let's if you could get your friends to play a narrative mission, or something kind of outlandish, or something that has you know just kind of a cool scenario. And, and just kind of think back on those things. Hey, remember that time that, that one, I don't know, we'll say Stormcast Eternal just, like, wouldn't die and, like, the Nighthawn army just kept throwing crap at him and he just, like, would never go anywhere? They're kind of like those little memories that we, all gaming groups have. Um, if you then model a guy or give him a name or, you know what I mean, some kind of badge of honor for being so BA in that scenario, what you're doing is you're you're creating a link between modeling and its collection and also the stories that you and your gaming group share and those are the kind of things that matter uh, that's kind of probably my best suggestion to you is kind of making those links between the game and the memories and stories that are a part of it and so um, I, I think that's probably the most essential part for introducing competitive folks um, to more narrative stuff uh, when it comes to actually like getting people to be narrative, you, you can't make someone a storyteller. You know what I mean? Um, people, if they're not interested in the books and all kind of stuff, they're they're probably not going to change their minds drastically. Um, but what you can do is, is show them why those things are cool to you, and and try to invite them to join you. And that's that's realistically all any of us do, right? When you get a new player in the game, you're not coercing them into thinking something else is fun you're just showing why this is fun to you and hey do you want to join me and so i think there's nothing different about that with narrative stuff to competitive things hey this this cool conversion was born out of this great story either from an epic game that you had with your friends or a story from a black library novel and and, and making those cool connections so yeah let's move on to the next one that is from Joel Roan, I believe it's how it's pronounced. Uh, do you enjoy 2,500 plus uh, size games or smaller point games, like a thousand points? Uh, also, I let me see here. I love to put I uh, love. Also, I find I love to put variety of models on a table 
to just enjoy them versus actual effectiveness. Okay, so sorry, I'm just kind of paraphrasing because it's uh, there's like a weird space gap because of the email. Uh, do I enjoy larger point games or thousand point ones? I tend to enjoy thousand point to fifteen hundred is actually my favorite size so far. Uh, I find mainly the biggest factor is time. I find the amount of enjoyment I get for my time uh, diminishes uh, when you get to the 2,000 plus area. Um, the, the Maggotkin game we did with, with the corn, that was a 2,000 point game, and that took us a little while. Had an absolute blast. Uh, the nice thing is, is that both of those factions are predicated on dying fast. And so, you know, things were brutal and just got taken off the table really quickly. So that game went pretty quick. But on the whole, when you have one faction that's very uh, defensive, you know, if I was to play like a really beefy Nurgle army of all the demons that have disgustingly resilient, that, that could take forever. Um, so honestly, it's more of a, a time issue than anything else. If we were to do something very fun on R1, like um, they made those missions, uh, the, the new rules for like basically Apocalypse games. They gave it a new name, but I can't remember what it is off the top of my head. Um, I would be down for that. You know, I have to plan for an entire day of gaming at that point, but it would be a lot of fun. Uh, it's also the main reason we don't do a whole lot of Triumph and Treachery. We did it one night, and it was an absolute blast. Um, but getting the scheduling in order to do that multiple times, it's kind of rough. Because you think you're supposed to do Triumph and Treachery like a number of times, and then whoever wins the most, or if you win three times, then you're the actual champion. So it could be could be quite a long ordeal. Um, as far as your second question, uh, do I add... I build my list based on uh, whatever sounds fun. Like, I, I don't build um, tough-as-nail lists. Uh, even when I was playing the zine stuff, which were tough-as-nails and were super good, and um, you know, basically just I, I, I lost very few times with them. I did lose, but very few times. Um... It was always because this is what I think a demonic incursion looks like. You know, it had nothing to do... I, I probably would have been wiser to go with more horrors and, and, and things like that. Um, I know that the the flamers on the, the chariots that you make battle line were always kind of effective. Those kinds of things, I never cared about that. Uh, I have, I'm a tend to be a very thematic player. And of course I do play Slaves of Darkness. And so... I have a little story for like why this unit would le uh, would join this champion. You know what I mean? Like something had to happen narratively for this champion to like have control or subjugation over this unit. And so I don't know. I, I like that kind of stuff. I like making that storytelling. I haven't uh, fully fleshed out a story for my fire slayers yet. Um, I want them to be like I said from the realm of life. Uh, but what that story looks like, that arc looks like, I haven't quite developed it yet. Um, their story's pretty pretty clear in terms of, like, there's a patriarch, the Rune Father, who I just finished painting. Um, but I haven't, you know, I haven't given him a name. Um, so, you know what I mean? I haven't figured out what his little lodge is like in terms of lore. I'm actually planning on doing a series of videos that kind of dives into uh, creating a lore for your army. And so once I get the Fire Slayers painted up, I'll, I'll kind of touch on that and we'll do a video series about like you know start to finish here's how you can create some units create some memorable things it doesn't require conversions it just you know or or expert painting skills to make something your own it just requires time and and just some concepts that you think are cool for storytelling and that was a really long explanation to say that i pick whatever i want rather than <laughs> picking uh the most effective units so i'm grabbing a paint here okay moving on Steve uh, says, if they came out with a new human faction, what would you like it to be thematically, aesthetically, and play style? Ooh. A new human faction. Okay. Uh, let me think about that one. Humans. I want it to be something technological, for sure. Um, I mean, if, if we're talking about like a, a brand new, kind of like the KO where like um, the uh, character in Overlord is like brand new in terms of like all dwarves everywhere. Um, if you're talking about remaking a faction, I want the Devoted of Sigmar to come next. Because I think they display the darker side of that same religious zeal that kept everyone together and holy and pure in the Rumgate Wars and all that stuff like that. Like I think that would be legit. It would also be super grim because <laughs> they're they're not nice people. They're not great people. 
Uh, as far as if I was going to create something from scratch, hmm, probably, probably some kind of like engineering core, I think. Um, and and not uh, you know if there was a human aspect to basically what the iron mold arsenal is, people who are assigned to detachments of, of free guilds and things like that, master uh, weaponsmiths and things like that, like the, one of the characters from uh, Spear of Shadows was a iron mold arsenal guy. He was a sniper, basically. I mean to put it really simply, that's exactly what he was. You know I want a human core that relies on um, infiltration and. That kind of stuff. So having a, a human army that could like infiltrate into the board upfield, right in your opponent's face, and then kind of act as rangers and snipers, those kinds of things would be really, really legit. Uh, I don't, I don't think the strength of humans is in their like man at arms. So like free guild is awesome. I don't want a ton of just like men at arms. You know what I mean? I don't want a whole bunch of factions. That can be free guild's thing. Um, but I think that having Different detachments, even if they're they're kind of called, you know, there's different uh, chambers for Stormcast, and they all do different things. Even if there was a different, quote unquote, for lack of a better term, chamber of free guild that was like rangers and, and snipers and things like that, I think that would be super cool. Especially if they had like steam cannons and stuff like that. Um, yeah, that's probably what I would go with. I'd probably go with uh, snipers and, and ranged combat and uh, infiltrators and things like that. Good question. That's actually a really good question. I have to put that some more. Uh, Banner asks, do you think GW have gone about AOS in a very, we'll, we'll, we'll condense that bad word to backwards motion. Um, let's see. So I'm going to paraphrase this question a little bit. Uh, you need so many books to play with the General's Handbooks, the Battle Tomes, Malign Sorcery. I feel that AOS was rushed and they maybe should have spent more time um, instead of making supplement after supplement. Um, not like 40k where the codex is all that you need. Uh, uh, I like AOS very much, but it does make me wonder what GW are thinking. So this is a common complaint where they came out with the General's Handbook, the Core Rule Book, the Army Has a Battle Tome, and then also Malign Sorcery. What I would say uh, is I don't have a problem with it, <laughs> um, to put it in short. So, so the thing is with 40k... At this point, yes, you are correct. All you need is the core rulebook uh, and your your codex. It's not going to stay that way. Uh, and the reason is um, that's what AOS was its first year. It was just battle tomes and, and your, your free downloadable, all that junk online. Um, I would say it, it had even of a less start. Like you need it required to carry less than you do need now for 40k. Um, the thing is, is all of the additional things that you mentioned are all bolt-on to the game. If you want to play a match play game, this is the this is the cost. You get to carry your General's Handbook, which is actually very light. It's very well printed this year. Um, if you want to play Malign Sorcery, these guys are not going to play Malign Sorcery. They have no reason to. Uh, they could bring the optional weapons from the realms if you want to, but they're not required. And if you choose to use that bolt-on thing, you, you can carry it. That's just fine. Um... As far as, like, my point being that they're not necessary books. They're necessary if you want to play a certain way with certain friends using certain things and certain abilities and spells and all that stuff like that. But they're not necessary to the core function of the game. And so that I'm pretty sure that's how they think about it when they release these things. Um, as far as, I, I just, my thing is, is that if you look at the Malign Sorcery book, it is extremely small and light. If you carry around the core rule book that you got from, not not the actual, the book book, like the Megatome, that's all the lore, but the 18-page print-off that they gave you in the two-player starter set, or you just download it from the internet and print it off, that's not big. And you can, both of those can easily slide into your General's Handbook. Probably not the Malign Sorcery Book Camp, but together they don't form a whole lot of weight. So between those things and the free app, I don't, I don't carry around a lot of stuff for AOS. Um, I really don't. Uh, I carry my stuff quite a bit because uh, I go down to a different town where the guys in Real Rolling Ones are uh, about 30 minutes away and it's never felt like I'm carrying a lot of stuff um, as far as like did they plan all this stuff out absolutely they planned it out I mean they planned all these things out I'm not I'll be honest I'm not so crazy hyped about how they distributed stuff between um, you know like the Grand Alliance stuff is in the core rule book 
for allegiance abilities, but all the other allegiance abilities are in the general's handbook, and all the items for the units are there. But also, if you want to take the items from the realms, that's a malign sorcery. Like, it just kind of seems shotgunned across the place. But in terms of what you actually need to physically carry to play the game, I don't think is very much. I think it's actually pretty okay compared to say like if you're playing D&D with friends you can jam a backpack like with a metric ton of books depending on the monsters you want to play the dungeon that you're in how you designed it all those things character creation guides DM books you know what I mean so I don't I don't perceive it as being vastly different in fact I think it's less than the things I've seen my friends carry for D&D um, and this is my personal opinion some people if they have to carry more than one thing they don't like it thing about 40k is i guarantee you once this kind of lull period ends and in gw turns its eye back to them to really um not just put all the books out for the armies to have books but also start moving things forward by introducing new material and campaigns and i think that's all going to happen in the next year you're going to see an increase in there too and i really hope that they stay as light on content in terms of like the physical weight of what you have to carry to play that kind of lightness um I hope they stay just as, as smooth as AOS is, frankly. I think an app would go a long way to helping 40k be like that. Uh, next question comes from Nevisoff. I, I really apologize if I mispronounced that. Uh, what are your thoughts on having a Mordheim in the universe and or rules for Age of Sigmar? I'm down with it. There actually was a project um, on the Grand Alliance forum like forever ago uh, called the Hinterlands. I believe it was called. I, I never actually played it myself. Uh, but it was this, this kind of fan-made thing um, by folks who really, really enjoyed uh, Mordheim. And they kind of made their own AOS system for it. And uh, it looked really cool. They actually took it down once Skirmish was announced. Because they thought, oh, Skirmish is going to be basically uh, Mordheim. And then Skirmish came out and it is not Mordheim. There's not nearly the amount of depth and mechanical complexity and customization and things like that. Um, so I didn't get a chance to play it, and it's already down, never to be seen again, unfortunately. I think there's probably some guy with a PDF of it. Um, I mean, I would love it, you know. I, I would love if they did. They're coming out with kill teams right now for 40K, and I would love just a, a straight-up kill team port. You know, if I could create uh, an order, quote-unquote, kill team that has, like, you know, one Hearthguard Berserker and one Stormcast Eternal. I go buy an easy to paint set of Liberators to get myself one Stormcast. Heck yeah, I would. Um, I think that would be really, really cool. The problem comes with, like, when it comes to customizations, a lot of the newer kits for uh, Sigmar don't have. It's not like building a Stormcast unit where, like, you get five missile launchers and this one box can make a bajillion different options. If you're building like each guy individually and that kind of stuff, they're not kind of built that way. A lot of these things have, you can choose this one weapon or this one other weapon, and that's kind of what the unit is. These guys are the pole axes or just the big double-handed axe. That's what they are. There's nothing else to them. So when it comes to like how units kind of customize weapons and things like that, it's a little bit more of a limited palette. And so I think um, a lot of the, the leveling up abilities would really have to be focused on giving... Um, specific units like you know it, your ability isn't you have a shiny new weapon it's um, you get to reroll one hit roll this game or something like that but the problem is that requires a whole new level of balancing when it comes to the vast number of units and things like that there's just a lot involved to make those kinds of games very fair uh, and, and I think the most the easiest way probably is just to put a hard limit on the types of units that are involved um, if they were to say Kind of like how the Shades by our Warbands are, like that, like, these are these specific units that you can use in this game. You cannot use anything else. Um, you know, kind of like the gauge for Necromunda. Um, I, I think that's probably the best way to go, just to kind of keep the playing field level rather than opening it up to everyone. I would say, obviously, make sure that every faction, or you know, has something represented. Like, there should be some Seraphon presence, or, you know what I mean, like that, like, make sure everyone feels included. Um... But I think having a hard cap on what units are involved in the game are, would be essential to balancing it. I would love to see it. Like, I want a skirmish level game for AOS where, like, you know, jumping off cliffs matters and, you know what I mean, a guy runs to a balcony and throws his axe and because he's higher off he gets a better modifier to throw and that kind of, like, very granular um, 
system that kind of rewards smart play and uh, let's say have some cool cinematic moments like we were talking about the memories right you want to know why people play necromunda forever even though necromunda wasn't supported for like five years i don't know how long it was not supported i have no idea it's made that number up but it was a while <laughs> uh is it, because people had really great memories of crazy things like this one eshin ganger runs to a side of a portcullis and shoots off the side and nails some i don't know other guy gang and just like wrecks his day i don't know there's just like those memories like i said keep people engaged and that's exactly what those kinds of smaller skirmish games do when you can name your models and things like that a lot of fun great question um as far as like you know what do i think about it in terms of like aos lore uh, there's nothing wrong with it just you know they made shades by out of nowhere uh, which has an incredibly cool backstory and really the backstory that you would want for a skirmish game like mordheim that's why we were all kind of anticipating that it would be like mordheim but they just went in a different direction which is fine um and people seem to love uh, Underworld Shadespire, so uh, I don't I don't play it myself, but uh, you know, people love it and it's it's hopefully selling really well for GW. I really hope that. Um, but it is not Mordheim, and that was kind of the the thing I needed to wrestle with when it came out. I was like, oh, I want it to be this other thing. I'll wait until they make that. I'll wait until they make an actual Mordheim esh one. Let's see. Let's move on. Next question is from Austin Jones. Uh, how were the elf gods able to bind Slanesh between Olgu and Haish? Whose job is it to make sure Slanesh doesn't wake up? Do the other gods know about Slanesh's location, namely Sigmar and Korn? I'm not sure why you picked out those two. It's kind of funny. Um, so I'll answer these kind of questions in a linear fashion. Uh, how are the elf gods able to bind Slanesh between Olgu and Haish? That is the subject of a little bit of question. Um... We have hints and we have cool little uh, shout outs, but functionally what we know from, uh, I think it was the Daughters of Cain book, mostly is where that comes from. When the end of the world, old world happened and Slanesh was like all fat and glutted, he trying to kind of hide away until his, you know, overindulgence <laughs> gut hurt passed. And it seems like, um, uh, sorry, I just realized the guy who made these models did something super funny. He put the hands on backwards. That's okay. It won't matter when it's painted. Um, <laughs> uh, Zinch found Slanesh all gutted and bloated and unable to move. And somehow was able, we don't really know the details yet, but tip off Tyrion and Teclis to what was going on, that he was there. And um, at that point, so the elves then found him. It looks like there's some kind of machinations by Zinch to kind of take out one of his brothers from the great game. The great game being the four chaos gods trying to kill each other and, and be the ultimate rulers. Um, so that, that was kind of the starting point was Zinch's influence, though they don't know that. Like, Zinch didn't call up Teclas, my boy, I got him, you know, got Slanesh canceled. They just kind of stumbled upon him in a very uh, compromising position, as one does with Slanesh. And... Um, from there, they bound him in chains. Uh, they found, at some point, Marathi, who was basically barfed up from uh, Slanesh naturally. Like, she did something to make Slanesh barf. And so after they found her, they connected the dots of being like, okay, so we have Slanesh captured. We found him. We put him in chains. And now we know that someone can come out of him. Like, those souls are not gone. Let's put two and two together and make a plan happen to get the rest of the souls out of there. And that's when they basically begin extracting souls by making him sick, barfing them up, and then they take those souls and reform them to their own desires. Marathi got her portion and made him into the half serpentine, half uh, Daughters of Cain Dark Elf kind of look that her faction has. Um, the Malusi and the Canari. And then we know that the Deepkin were Teclis's attempt to recreate High Elves of old, but the corruption from Slanesh was too strong. So that's kind of the, the function of how it happened. They, Zinch is hinted at having some part to play in luring the Elves to find him. Uh, they found him, bound him in chains, realized because Marathi was out that they could get souls out of him, and, and kind of began the process of doing that. Now, your next question is, whose job is it to make sure Slanesh doesn't wake up? Slanesh is super awake during all of this, constantly vomiting out souls in the most uncomfortable and undecadent way. 
Um, we know this because as the events in Malign Portents are happening, um, there's there's snippets here and there of it was mainly in the actual Malign Portents uh, campaign book. Like all the Chaos Gods show their kind of reaction to what's, what what uh, Nagash is doing, and they have a snippet where Slanesh reacts and and basically his impetus for wanting Malign Portents to stop is because if Nagash rules everything and there's no more uh, anyone living and, and free to do whatever they want, then there's no more pleasure and there's no more self-indulgence and pursuit of perfection and therefore he is very unhappy. Which means he is awake and attentive to the events that are happening in the mortal realms. So that was important to see Slanesh pop up there. Your last question. Do the other Chaos Gods know about Slanesh's location, namely Sigmar and Korn? I do not believe so. I believe his location is the best kept secret in the mortal realms. Uh, my thought is that probably only the four chaos, uh, sorry, four elven gods, uh, not gods, but collection of deities, because like, uh, uh, Marathi's not a deity, she's kind of the, the kind of pincer in that. So basically, Teclas, Tyrion, um, Marathi, and Malarian, who used to be Malekith, uh, are the ones who know where he is. Because um, here's the thing, like, oh, the Daughters of Cain and Edith Deepkin rely on secrecy to keep doing what they're doing. Like, the Malusai and Kneri are the best kept secrets in the Daughters of Cain army. The average free guild guy isn't really allowed to see them. Um, and so, when they do go out in public, they use magics to disguise themselves so people don't see that they're actual monsters. My assumption is they have to know he exists, because how do you explain Marathi's appearance? Like, she... Sigmar knows what she looks like. Um but I'm not sure how far they've kind of probed into that conversation of like, so, Malarian, your mom's kind of a snake lady. Tell me about that. You know what I mean? Like, I don't... <laughs> that conversation has never been uh, detailed in any books. So, to my knowledge, no, they don't know. Especially, I can probably say for sure, Corn does not know. Uh, I'm sure he would have sent an army to stop the forces of order from getting souls out of Slanesh and therefore also kill him at the same time. Just just like Zinch can get the uh, the great game uh, that much further in, like by killing one of the players, uh, mainly Slanesh. So I'm going to say that, and then Sigmar is kind of a question mark. Maybe he's just not asking a lot of questions because uh, he wants the Pantheon to be together more so than, than and kind of knowing everything. So that is hopefully an answer to all your questions here. Uh, last one comes from Casper Anderson. Casper asks, with the new Stormhost specific rules, how would you handle an Anvils of Held and Hammer slash Maelstrom of Light themed army? Uh, can you use your influence as a superstar status to introduce 40k like detachments? I'll be honest with you, I hate 40k detachments. <laughs> Straight up. Um, it's actually one of the reasons I sold off a lot of my 40k stuff. I hate list building in 40k. Um, as far as how I would handle those things, I have not looked at the specific book yet. I bought it. Um, I started diving into the Nighthaunt one because I was looking for lore on the Realm of Death. So I, I don't really have a good answer for you at this moment. Um, I will try to revisit that when um, I've had a chance to really dig into the Stormhost book. Now, as far as, like, when you say, how do I handle those things, um, you mean in terms of, like, does the list look like that faction? I, I, I don't know. I don't, I'm not quite sure I understand the question there. What I would say is, um, looking at the Anvils of Held and Hammer, which are the, if you're not familiar, that's the, the black Sigmarite armor, the gold trim. Uh, they showed up in the realm of death during the realm gate wars to help out uh, Neferata. Um, anything, I don't know. They uh, Every storm cast, every storm host has every chamber available to it, so you can really make them whatever you want. Um, so let me look at the rules for those, and I'll try to revisit that question if you could message in and kind of clarify. I'm not a fan of attachments because... Um, it's basically a complicated version of open play to me. But it's actually, I should make that a topic. I should do that, comparing uh, 40k to Age of Sigmar now. Um, like I said, I actually sold off a bunch of 40k stuff to get these little guys. I got a huge lot of Fire Slayers for my 40k because I was tired of that game. And I hated list building and it was a terrible chore. So, I will talk about that at some point. 
we're going to transition now to my topics for the day. I had two topics today, and those are my Fire Slayers army and what my thoughts are kind of in conclusion for the um, quote-unquote free summoning for Blades of Corn. Now, let me get another paint here, and we'll start digging into all of that noise. Uh, as far as the Fire Slayer army goes, uh, what I functionally have to kind of sum up without going into individual unit names in case you're not familiar with them uh, is I have a star collecting box, another unit of Volkite Berserkers, which is their basic line infantry, and uh, three boxes of the Hearthguard elite type units. I have ten of the Berserkers, which are the elite melee guys that you see here on the left. I guess on your your screen. Yeah, it's the left. Okay. I'm not crazy. You're crazy. Um, and then uh, five of the guys carrying the big flame cannon things that shoot like 15 inches and a bajillion shots. Um, where I want to go with the army is I actually really want to focus on... Um, actually, before I begin this discussion, I want to tell you. There is a Facebook group for Fire Slayers. If you just type in Fire Slayers, it's the first group that comes up. They are the nicest bunch of people on the whole internet. Um, I hopped on there, introduced myself, and just a lot of warm welcomes and, and uh, kind words. Uh, not not because I'm too pissed tough, because somebody you know who has online influence is interested in their army, and they were like, "Oh man, like this isn't get enough notice." And everyone was very helpful because I am very lost when it comes to list building. Um, I grabbed these guys primarily because one, it was available, and two, I I fell in love with them while I was doing the uh, Fire Slayers lore week. Because um, up until that point, I hadn't really honestly given them a fair shake, and I, I actually really enjoy them. Between that and the Fire Slayers represented in the book Spear of Shadows, uh, that was a lot of fun to read about uh, and kind of engage with those characters. So there's there's one singular Fire Slayer in there, and he's super cool. He tries to fight a island-sized whale at one point by himself, and I respect that. Um, so yeah, I have... I think it comes out to be like 1,200 points when it's all said and done. Um, hmm, the skin's not quite dry on these guys, so I'm actually going to pause there and just chat for a bit. Let me see if I have anything else I can paint while I'm just sitting here chitting and chatting. Aha. Got this guy in a magma droth. This is actually a runestone in the magma droth, which is how they decided to build the star collecting box. I love this model. I'm a big dragon guy. If you're looking at home uh, or listening on the podcast, it's the Rune Sun on a Magma Droth, which is one of the most cool things ever as far as a creature goes. Um, yeah, so I got them. Uh, mainly the, the impetus for getting uh, Dwar. Now, I was either going to do this or Seraphon. And because um, I wanted something that color palette wise was very different from my Slaves to Darkness, uh, I have constantly been made fun of and tortured myself because I would buy an army, paint it up really well. You know, it's my normal tabletop standard. And then sell or trade it off. And my friends make fun of me. Mark and Jack and all those guys constantly. Um, and and part of it is hobby ADD. But also, I'm just a project guy. Like, once I feel done with a project, I like to move on and, and use that as a resource to get my next project. And that's just kind of how I am. I paint, you know, not models, but I paint armies. And then I move on and I have fun with all of them. Um, the reason I chose... These guys over Seraphon were one because there's not a lot of Fire Slayer content online, and um, I like having unique things. I'm, I am a special snowflake in that regard. I like having the army that no one else has. I, I'll totally admit to that being a, a sus, as they called it on uh, an old podcast that you listen to for War Machine and Hordes, um, which is a, a sus is a special unique snowflake. Um, just by having, you know, just an army that not many people play. Or at least not many people share. I'll put that. I think there are plenty of Fire Slayer players. Not a lot of content producers online who also play Fire Slayers. If you go to YouTube, there's like two or three channels that really, really go into them. Um, so, yeah. And, and more importantly, uh, when I was deciding between the two, I was like, okay, I need if I'm going to do that, I want something that also plays in a unique way. And um, with Malign Sorcery coming out, this is about the time where we started getting all, all the, not the, even the rumors anymore, but really just the hard facts from GW and their, and their preview articles about what Malign Sorcery was and what it meant and, and what magic was going to be like. 
I was like, well, what about those factions that don't have magic? Um, what is it going to be like to play against them and play, you know, as them? And that's when I decided um, the tiebreaker was that. I was just like, you know, I'll get a, a wholly unique play experience by being Fire Slayers versus my Slaves to Darkness. That's why when I bought my Malign Sorcery set, if you haven't seen it on Instagram, I've been converting and or theming all of my um, my endless spells. The cogs are all nurgly, and there's a, a blue horror going through the spell portal. He always had his top half's on one end and his bottom half's on the other. I had a lot of fun painting those. They were really cool looking. And so um, that that is why he is like that, is because I just wanted something cool, you know, and fun and different. Um, but as far as, like, oops, sorry, bumped the light there a little bit. As far as uh, play style goes, I wanted something that was just very, very different. And so that's exactly my really core reason for getting these guys. Now I am going to stay, uh, I'm going to stay all Juarden. Uh, the, the common theme that people have been looking at is including one of the new Stormcast Wizards. And that's awesome. And I, I love people who make thematic allies. And uh, I do not bemoan competitive folks who look for optimal builds. Um, for me personally, though, I got into this army because I wanted to play some Fiery Dwarves. And so the the biggest uh, concession I will make is taking a, a Rune Lord model from the Dispossessed section, or a faction, I should say. Not section, who am I talking about? Uh, and theming him to be uh, a Fire Slayer. And just really just using those rules, right? I mean, just making him a Fire Slayer guy. Uh, if you don't know, the, the Dispossessed Rune Lord gets to dispel like a wizard, but he gets plus two to do it, which is pretty amazing. And uh, I'll tell you what, any after seeing my game with Jack and his corn stuff, any unit that can unbind like a wizard, whether or not it's a wizard or not, uh, just went up in stock in a, in a huge way <laughs> um, when I was playing Jack. So he had the Blood Secrator. Uh, which, if you don't know, um, it forces your opponent to do... They have to re-roll successful um, spell-casting attempts while in its range, whatever the bubble range is. I know the Core Pilgrim one makes it bigger, so I can't tell you what the default one is. Um, makes it a bigger bubble. And uh, it was it was brutal. It was absolutely brutal to, like... Because I said the first turn I got, I managed to get uh, Blades of Putrefaction off. That was... After a reroll and his attempt to unbind from one of the uh, flesh hounds, I was like, "Whoa, <laughs> there's so much going on." Um, ways to shut down magic. So uh, you know, looking for any of those units that can really play a part in that kind of part of the game, uh, I think are huge. Uh, this was totally um, not on purpose, but uh, the realm of life does have a. Um, artifact that allows me to unbind like a wizard which I mean a lot of people like I when I was coming into the faction asking around about it people were like oh yeah just have him come from Garant so you can use that I was like oh that is a clever coincidence that I already have begun doing that thing um, so what I'm doing here is the um, painting a magma droth with a rune sun on it I'm going to do a, a fleshy almost like a pale skin tone for the underbelly and then do some cool uh fire highlights for the rest of it so we'll see how it looks kind of on the fence about how i wanted this dude to look but i'm just gonna just start painting stuff and see how i like it i don't think i can really go wrong with this guy he's pretty legit maybe make his horns a little crazy i love some of the horns they have in the actual uh battle tome so um yeah i'm very excited to see where the army goes i i i want them to be good you know those armies like where they're kind of underdoggy, <laughs> and you just kind of want them to win. Like that's kind of how I am with KO now. It's like anyone who's a KO player in my book is like, yeah, dude, keep it up, keep being awesome, um, because people are just crapping on that army left and right online, and I think it's a shame because I think there's so many cool things about it. Um, and you know, I don't know. I, I again, this channel is all about being positive. Um, because if you're not going to be positive, why are you talking about it? you got precious life to live. Um, but I'm also all about being honest with that. And they do have some difficulties. Um, just like, and then my, my tying it back, my point is, like, so do the, the Fire Slayers. So 
Yeah. I don't know. Um, as far as where I want to grow with the army, I'm sorry, I'm getting way off track with the Fire Slayers talking about freaking Rune Lords and all that stuff. Uh, I'm probably going to pick up a couple of Rune Lords to be able to unbind stuff. Magic is not uh, a huge problem for me and my friends, but we are getting into Night Hunt and Stormcast with the new wizard, so I think it'll be a cool addition to have. Um, I'm kind of interested to see how the new wizard, particularly the wizard unit that came in the uh, Soul Wars box, really affects um, the Stormcast. I think that would be interesting to see. I wonder like, if it's really going to become extremely prevalent or if for the most part people are going to pass on it. I don't know. I'm kind of I'm kind of debating about that because on the one hand, like some folks just really dislike the the units that summon. Uh, I'm just gonna look up magma droths here. Try to get a paint scheme I can steal. Oh nope, screwed that up. Okay, never mind. Went to the way wrong website. But with the undercoat donut, I can do the root zone. Okay. Um, as far as yeah, developing the army, I want to stick with uh, dispossessed and um, obviously fire slayers proper. I don't want to do any kind of stormcast stuff at all. I'm not opposed to them. It's just if I did stormcast, I have a theme that I want to do specifically. Um, that I, don't, I haven't looked at the book yet. I don't know how good it is, but I would really love to do a astral templars army. Because I love, love, love their color scheme. I love the red, or the that kind of um, screamer pink is the actual color they use. But I just love the way it looks. And I don't know how that would look with these guys. These guys are kind of more bright and fiery. Um, I'm interested to see how they do. People are really kind of bummed because they the main strategy that Fire Slayers apparently have been using. I'm just learning this now. Uh, was having just a whole bunch of Volkite Berserkers that got a maximum squad size bonus. So I got them really cheap, and you just flood the board with those. They get a 4-up um, save after the save if you have more than 20 models in the unit. And so just having large blocks of dudes just flooding the board. Well, in the last GHB, they got rid of the uh, maximum size unit bonus. And so a lot of people are really upset about that, which I understand that that's kind of your main thing. Um, some folks have said that what that inadvertently does is really raises the stock of Berserkers, the more elite ones that are here on the table. And, uh, and which is great because that's actually my favorite unit. That's the one I really want to focus on just thematically. I think it looks cool. Um, so I'm, I'm, not, I'm not opposed to that change, but also I wasn't playing before to really be hurt by it. You know what I mean? It's one of those things like people get upset about something and it just doesn't affect you because you're not, um, you know, not emotionally attached to it at all. Which is the thing. And let's see, just grabbing a brush here, and a paint here. I'm gonna do some dry brushing on this flesh. So, what I do on these guys is I give a base of what a Bugman's Glow and then Cadian Flesh. Do a wash of Reichland Flesh Shade and then a dry brush of this P3 paint called Midland Flesh. Um, I don't have anything really emotionally attached to this P3 paint, but it just does really well, and I've had it for years because I started playing this with uh, War Machine Hordes. Uh, moving into my focus of the army is obviously going to be Hearthguard Berserkers. I'm looking to do a lot of the um, pull arm things, which if you don't know, every time they hit, um, you roll a die, and on a 3-up, it does a Mortal Wound in addition to any other damage. So they're not going to do a ton of other damage otherwise. Their stat line's pretty meh. But they can uh, deliver some serious Mortal Woundage. If you take a battalion called Lords of the Lodge, they get to pile in and attack twice in a turn. Now, the secondary effect of the Lords of the Lodge is a very interesting one, and I'd be interested to hear everyone's thoughts on this. Basically, the idea is um, the way it works, the battalion actually works, once per game, you can declare before you do your turn roll off, like to see who has priority. Either you're going to use Lord Lodge ability at that point, you add one to your die roll for determining who goes next um, for every hero in the battalion left on the table. There's three heroes, so you would effectively get a plus three if you did it early in the game. Um, 
people have said, well, you can't modify the turn priority dice anymore. A lot of debates about it. Uh, I cleared it with the ones that guys at rerolling ones, and they're fine with it. Um, it's not game breaking. It's just a once die roll thing. Um, I know people. I think the real intention behind that ruling was because uh, Kairos Fate Weaver was wrecking some days uh, with that, and so um, I wonder. I wonder how much of it was that versus like the battalion just not being updated. But, you know, it's a good starting place. It makes my favorite unit at the pile and attack twice. If you go to the Vostarg Lodge uh, for Fire Slayers, um, then you get to add a second unit of Hearthguard Berserkers, which is pretty tight. Um, so that'd be kind of cool to do that as well. I don't know. They're just my favorite unit so far. When I joined the Fire Slayer group, they said, well, here's, here's how you build a Fire Slayer army. You pick your favorite unit, which, uh, you know, unit of, of body. So the guys with the flaming pyres that shoot fire, the pole axe arm guys, or uh, your baseline uh, Volkite Berserker. You pick whatever one you like the most, and you just build a ton of them, and, and depending on who your general is, they're probably going to be battle line. And that's kind of how the, the list thing works. Which I thought was fantastic advice, very helpful. Uh, and that's exactly what I did. So, mine are the the um, Hearthguard Berserkers, is my, my chosen uh, unit. So, um, also because this just plays to that special unique snowflake thing I was talking about earlier. When you look online, a lot, sorry, excuse me, hiccup. Uh, a lot of folks play that they take a rune smiter, who is a hero that allows you to basically deploy off board and then to uh, tunnel in first turn. And about 20 of those gun guys and just drop behind the opponent and blast them away uh, turn one, which is a super valid strategy. It's just not one I'm terribly interested in. Um, I would rather march forward and, and charge and all that kind of stuff. So, um, yeah, that's kind of the plan here. It's just really diving into the parts of the army that I like and, and just kind of finding new and creative ways to win with them. I want to I wanna have a good, pretty good showing on, on uh, rerolling ones, um, at least represent the faction quite a bit. So, yeah, if you have thoughts on the army... Uh, good ways to get the most mileage out of the Hearthguard Berserkers. I would love to hear your thoughts. Uh, message me on Facebook and we'll have a strike up a conversation. Um, I think they are an intriguing unit in an already extremely interesting army. And one day I might pick up the Seraphon. You know, I might, I might redouble on that one. Just because Space Lizards. Uh, what's next here? Oh, my second topic of the day was talking about the free summoning. Hopefully I can stay on track a little bit better this time. When it comes to the, the free summoning, if you're not familiar with the Blades of Corn update that they got in the uh, General's Handbook, basically every time a unit dies, they generate a blood type point. That's friend and foe when a unit dies. Um, and you can then, basically they got a, a list of like, hey, you can summon um, a special unit. You can summon a unit based on how many blood type points it is. And, and they range in, in price. I think the real balancing factor, before we go into this conversation, for all these new summoning armies uh, is the balancing factor isn't going to be does it cost points or not, but I think it's going to be whatever resource mechanic they've been given is the amount of that resource required uh, accurate to depict how hard it should be to summon this thing. Um, I have some thoughts. I don't think the Zinch one, I'm very skeptical of it. Um, I know a lot of the things from there are very expensive which I think they need to be from a balance perspective. Um, but we're talking about corn today. Corn specifically. So in the game that I had with Jack, he was able to rack up pretty quickly. He took a bunch of minimum squad units, things that were designed to die pretty quick, and then any artifacts he could find to really increase his odds and time of getting uh, blood tithe points. He even damaged his own units with a special prayer that allows you to generate them, which I thought was pretty legit, um, and I would certainly do that because it's very thematic, you know, just, just shedding your own blood to make this stuff happen. Uh, he was able to bring a Bloodthirster on the table, which when you hear that at first, it might be like, whoa, a Bloodthirster! But the more we were talking about the game, you know, honestly, because he has to start nine inches away, um, and he's not obviously coming in first turn, I, I didn't feel like it was unfair. I will say that. I never felt, like, scared of him. You know what I mean? I was able to tie him down with the Glotkin... Uh, and, and Jack's response at that point was like, well, yeah, but I just tied down a 420 unit of yours for free. 
it's like, but it, it, it was not it wasn't free because it cost you a lot of your army to do that. You lost board presence and real estate to make that happen. Um, and, and the reason my Glotkin is where it is is because I capitalized on that and pushed way far forward. So I, I don't think it's free. I think um, the most important part of this discussion is breaking ourselves away from um, points at all. Simply because um, if we thought about board presence and um, how close you are to objectives and those kinds of things as resources and factored those in as well, I bet things would see a lot more seem a lot more balanced. So, I mean, we're talking about like the Slanesh ones, right? Slanesh ones, your heroes have to be hurting people but not killing them or being hurt and not being killed. How many heroes can you really sacrifice or, or get into combat, even no matter how good they are to combat, um, and, and still be doing good with them? To put them in that kind of danger and still be, you know, in a good position for your heroes to give out their buffs and all that kind of stuff like that. I would wager that you're making a choice, right? A real delicate choice between keeping your army synergistic and having those options available when your hero phase comes about and sacrificing things to get new units on the table. Um, Jack in our game sacrificed a lot of units to be able, by the end of the game, there was Scarbrand, there was the Blood Secrator, there was, I think, one or two, um, whatever the priest guys on foot are, and the demon, uh, the bloodthirster he summoned, but there wasn't a whole lot else. There was the one small unit off to the side that captured an objective. You know what I mean? But like in terms of if I had anything else with any kind of real push, it would have toppled. It would have just crumbled beneath me. Um, at that point, my main problem, like I said earlier, was I didn't capitalize on my initial charge. So that was what I think cost me the game. But the fact of the matter is, I didn't feel like what he had at the end of the game was unbeatable at all. One of the, the bloodthirster he summoned, I got down to like three wounds left. Um, he was in a bad place because those guys are made of paper. You know, it's a big paper axe. And so, you know, like when you read it online, it's easy to say like, oh, they just get free stuff. Um, and and but when I played it, it didn't play, you know, in a negative way. It played in a very thematic and fun way. I will say that. Um, I do think we're going to see tournament players who are really good at like point by point capitalizing on the summoning mechanics. Like I know Jack tried hard to like really lean into that mechanic and, and get the most out of it. I know for a fact that some like Adepticon guy is going to look at that, not necessarily for just corn, but maybe maggot kin or some other faction, maybe the Zinch one still, and really just turn it up to 11. There, someone's going to find that combination and crank it. Um, so that it's just ridiculous. So that's kind of the main thing there, um, as far as like what's to come. On your average game night play, I didn't feel like it was it was unfair at all. Um, I felt like Jack's army was still very beatable, and he's a great player. If you've not seen him reeling once, he had a terrible luck throughout the path to glory. But when you're playing a real game, um, like a, a standard game with uh, match play missions and like that, he's a phenomenal. He's a top general in our in our group for sure, and so he was really concerned about the balancing factor of it and then afterwards i was like this is really great you know what i mean uh, i was playing a non-optimized maggot kin list i feel like if i had also leaned into that mechanic i could have done a lot more i just brought a second tree on but there was many times where a five-man unit of plague bearers on one of those objectives that were far enough away from everyone would have definitely won me the game so i had options the problem is and this kind of leads into my next thing from a mechanical gameplay perspective, I felt very satisfied with the, uh, particularly the corn uh, blood type point system for summoning new models. I thought it was great, period, end of story. The second part, to kind of go along with our discussion from our last while you were forging, if you didn't watch, um, we had a, a, a viewer towards the end kind of get in the chat box about how daunting it is when you're starting a new army like Maggotkin. Um, when, when you feel like the pressure to buy more stuff simply so you can summon it, possibly. And it was a really good discussion. There was a lot of cool back and forth from various people in the chat. And really what it came down to was, I don't want to feel pressured to buy a bunch of stuff. Um, and and that actually, that was part of the reason that I decided to put the Slaves to Darkness on the shelf. I was like, I could keep playing Maggot Kim, but I'm never going to play them well because I'm not going to lean into the um, abilities that make them great. I'm not going to go out and buy a bunch of plague, uh, sorry, the feculent narmaws 
to have a bunch of trees. And I'm not really going to go out and buy a bunch of um, of the heroes to make those synergies work really well. Like I want it to be minimal because I am, like I said, waiting on my uh, Dark Oath book that may or may not exist. I don't actually know. And so the idea being like, well, I'm not going to lean into it. And so it's just going to be dead mechanics. I really don't want anyone commenting on R1 about how, you know, I'm, I'm not a great player because I'm just not taking part in all the things that the faction has to offer. And people will because they're people on the internet. So I decided I'd just skip it. Um, so, you know, I felt that pressure. What we what one person suggested in the comments, and I thought it was a great suggestion. I really appreciated it. Was they said, well, why don't you go out and just buy a great unclean one, just a great unclean one, and then if you know that way you can be in the back of your mind using the mechanic because um, you're saving up for a great unclean one. And hey, if you reach it, you put your great unclean one on the table. If you don't, that's fine. You know what I mean? You're still taking advantage, and you were gaming for something. You just have that one big investment. And that way you don't have to worry about that mechanic again. I thought that was a pretty fair compromise. The person who had the concern also felt that way. Um, but yeah, you know what I mean? Like, I, I don't like um, feeling like when a new player approaches an army and says, that rotty, nasty thing with all the pus and the goils, that looks cool, I want to play that. And then someone has to explain to them, like, okay, well, here's the mechanic, and you're not really playing the army at its full potential until you buy a whole bunch of peripheral stuff that you may or may not use. You may or may not summon all these trees. You may or may not summon all these plague bearers or whatever. Um, it can feel daunting as a consumer. And that's also something that Jack uh, had expressed concern about as well. Uh, more so in the idea of, like, uh, being more of like a money grab type thing he didn't he didn't he's he's very positive but it was the idea of like this felt like a sales move rather than a game design move um and i don't know you know and I, I get that it is definitely a sales move everything they do is a sales move it's a company try to make money dollar dollar bills yo uh at the same time i feel like the mechanic worked functionally very well in our game i never felt like i didn't have a chance to win i feel like my loss was my own fault I felt like the the way he brought units on was very cool and very thematic, and I loved it. Uh, in addition to that, though, like, what if Jack didn't have that Bloodthirster? Or what if he didn't have stuff? What if he was a new player who didn't have those options? I've just evaporated his army. If someone started, uh, because this coming week they're pre-ordering up the um, the new Star Collecting sets, which is basically just the Stormcast and Corn Half from the old starter set, like, if someone has those halves... Uh, and they just start playing from there with the corn thing, I'm going to eat that army for breakfast. You know what I mean? Like the stuff, even just what I have on the table here can probably eat those armies. More the corn one than the uh, the Stormcast one. But the point being that like, um, telling a new player, okay, you have this thing. Okay, well this army is predicated on dying very quickly so you can summon more stuff. Oh, you don't have that stuff to summon? Then you're kind of missing out. I mean, that can create negative experiences. And that's more what I'm talking about. I think we can all understand the idea of of not wanting to be kind of uh, weighed into buying more stuff, being happy with what you have. And I think that's ultimately what should be the goal. Uh, so I want to hear your thoughts on that. Um, like I said, if you're sold out on those armies, if you love Zinch and you just want to keep summoning stuff and keep shooting magical lightning at people, I, I think that one's very cool. I'm kind of unsure. I want to see that one played. Uh, and I almost wish I didn't get rid of the zine stuff simply so I could test it. It isn't, it isn't an army that really interests me where it is right now. Um, but it'd be cool to be able to like see that mechanic in action. I'm sure I will. I'm sure I'll just be playing battle ports about it. Uh, the corn one, I'm giving my, my official Doug seal of approval. Slanesh one, I want to try it out. Uh, I know uh, Jack himself, who plays corn right now, is really amped for whenever uh, Slanesh gets his slash her slash its release. Uh, at some point, um, but yeah, like I said, I'm giving it. I'm giving it the thumbs up because I had a fantastic game on Thursday, uh, and it was no small part because of how great and smooth and clear I thought the summoning mechanic went off. And so um, I'm just really pumped about that. And I think let's see, it's been wow, it's been like an hour and twenty five minutes of perpetual talking. My voice is going hoarse. And I have these guys in the washes you're just drying. Um, this is the one of the hardest parts of these Fire Slayer models. is just getting all the flesh tones done so, done. so if you're listening to this via podcast, all I did was I did the base coat 
uh, Bugman's Glow for all, what, 15 of these dudes? And uh, then went over with Kitty and Flesh Tone, did a wash, a Reikland Flesh Shade, and a dry brush of my P3 paint on all 15 of them. So the skin is all done, except for the runes inside the skin, which I always do last. Just because it's easier to clean them up when they're, uh, it's easier to clean the skin up when everything else is done around it. And so uh, if you're curious about how the progress on these things goes, I do the leather straps and all the tabards and all that stuff next. And then all the metallics give that all a wash, and then go into the beard. Always do beards last because uh, it's just easier. They're kind of, uh, the way they sit on the model, it's always like the most front outward things. They're easiest to reach. So everything else is done because it's kind of beneath and kind of hidden beneath the beard. Don't want to accidentally uh, get some tabard colors on that, on that fiery red beard. So uh, thank you all so much for watching. Again, this is my first episode, so it's bound to be a little rocky. But I'd love to hear some feedback. If you could go ahead and shoot me an email, ask a question, whatever you'd like to do, through the link in the description down below, whether that's on iTunes, whether it's on uh, the YouTube channel, I would love to hear it. Uh, thank you all so much for watching and listening, and I will see you next time in the next While You're Reforging.